to do. Okay. So we're going to look at ultimately the ethics of Aristotle, because it all starts with him. And to give you a real uh, full understanding of his, his theory, we're going to start surprisingly with his metaphysics, because he grounds his ethics in his metaphysics. And then we'll look at natural law theory and, and virtue ethics, which are the two modern day descendants of his view. And I'll how Aquinas fits in all this. A little bit of background if you're interested. Aristotle, 384 BC to 322 BC. He lived in and around Greece and Macedonia. He taught Alexander the Great of Alexander the Great fame. You may have heard of him. He studied at the Academy, which was uh, the an early university run by Plato, who was the student of Socrates. But after failing to become the head of the Academy after Plato's death, he eventually founded a rival school called the Lyceum. And he was so influential that he was simply called the philosopher by medieval Christian scholars, including Aquinas, and the first teacher by medieval Muslim scholars. So you know you've got it made as a philosopher when you've got a title like that. But again, as I said, ultimately he grounds his ethics in his metaphysics. So I'm going to give you a very brief introduction to the metaphysics. So first of all, what is it? Well, it's the branch of philosophy concerned with existence, being, and the fundamental nature of the world slash reality. Aristotle labelled it first philosophy and said it's the subject that deals with first causes and principles of things. But many philosophers will dispute these definitions and even whether metaphysics can be defined at all. And I suppose I should say meta means above or beyond or after physics. So physics is in for the study of the physical world. So it's looking at those concepts and those those um, realities that need to be in place in order for us to do anything else, including physics including science. So what sort of questions does it answer? What is it that makes a thing what it is rather than something else? That question might seem so obvious it sort of doesn't need an answer. When you actually try and articulate it, it becomes surprisingly complicated, surprisingly. How can things maintain their identity over time? Things are constantly undergoing change, and yet at least some things are the same, the same entity you know, uh, today as they were yesterday and will be the same tomorrow. We still think um, they're the same thing, but they've undergone change. So how is that possible? What are the different ways in which something can be said to exist? What's the nature of causation? And so on. So we all do metaphysics. Or we all have metaphysical assumptions in the back of our minds. We often can't uh, articulate them, but they are there. And the, the job of the metaphysician is to really draw them out and make them uh, explicit. I think it's best, obviously, just to jump in and I think when you see how Aristotle approached it, you'll see the sorts of questions he's interested in. Good. So <coughs> key concepts. First of all, act and potency, which we're going we're to break down. Don't worry. Don't get intimidated by the by the fancy terms. And then we're going to look at those in a little more detail. And we're going to come across what, what's called the four causes, the formal cause, the material cause, the efficient cause and the final cause. Okay, so act and potency. So being in act or actuality or act the way a thing actually is. Being in potency, potentiality, the way a thing potentially could be. And so everyday objects are combinations of act and potency. They actually have certain properties and are in certain states, but potentially they could have different properties and be in different states. So right now I'm actually sitting down, but I have the potency to stand up. Yeah. And so change is thus the actualization of potency. If I change from, from sitting down to standing up, um, that my potency to stand up becomes actualized. Uh, now, note, note, not all uh, changes, as, as you already know, are, are two-way, right? So sometimes you might have a potency that once it's actualized, you go back to the previsuality. Some of them may be two-way. So uh, if, I stand up and I can, if I stand up, I can then sit back down. That's reversible. But if you bake uh, a piece of uh, pottery, uh, you know, some clay in a kiln, yeah, it, it has the... And actually has a certain shape and has the potency to take on another shape. But if you then bake it in a kiln, it loses that potency. So that's kind of a one way, a one way change, as you as as we know in in the real world. Understanding how you'd analyze it metaphysically. So when we look at these, this distinction between act and potency in a little more detail, we find that there are what Aristotle calls the four causes. And it's important to realize that these are not causes as we would tend to think of them. It would be better to think of them as principles or ways of standing something or aspects. Uh, so don't get hung up on the word false. So the first is the formal cause, which is the what it is. 
The second is the material cause, what it's made of. The third is the efficient cause, the where it came from. And the final cause is the what it does. Good, so form the what it is. So examples include really obvious things, an acorn, a ball, a human being, a, a cat, a table. It's what they actually are. Matter is the what it's made of. We're all material objects because we're all made out of matter. None of us are, are like Casper the Friendly Ghost floating around disembodied or anything like that. None of us are, are angels or ghosts or material objects. And so, so we're made out of matter. And this matter is then arranged according to our form. And the table has four legs and a, a, a surface, a tabletop, because it's a table. Uh, a ball is is a, is a sphere. The matter is arranged in a sphere, but it's a ball. This matter then has the potency to take on another form. So, uh, again, the standard example involves clay. You can mould it into the shape of a statue. It therefore has the form of a statue. But you could smush it down and then mould it into the shape of a bowl. Obviously, if you bake it in the kiln, then, then it's locked in place. So hylomorphism is the theory that material objects are combinations of form and matter. So morphe means form, hylo means matter, hylomorphism, matter form. Material objects are combinations of form and matter. A material object's essence is its form instantiated in matter. So this is simply to point out that there's something about being human as a material uh, existence. Uh, which means that essentially we're in matter. To be fully human involves being in matter. To be a ball, you need to be in matter. To be a tree, you need to be in matter. But if there are immaterial objects, which I think there are, but, uh, if there are material objects, and their essence is the same form. And so the standard examples here are God and the angels. But they are not material objects. So they don't have any um, uh, material cause or anything like that. Um, so in, in that sense, their essence is just the same as their form. This is simply a conceptual distinction. There's the what we are considered without matter, and then there's the what we are with matter, which is how we actually exist. So both matter and form are intrinsic to the object in question because they make it what it is in and of itself and without reference to any external object or principle. Now, this distinction comes from Aquinas. So I haven't I haven't talked about uh, his life and history. I've done that in, in other videos, and you can find uh, plenty of information on that. But Aquinas was a medieval uh, philosopher and theologian, and he he took Aristotle's work and developed it and, and put his own spin on it. But one of the interesting distinctions that he makes, which I think you find in a sort of proto-form in Aristotle, if you're interested in his distinction between uh, artifacts and, and natural objects. Uh, Aquinas distinguishes between what's called a substantial form and accidental form. So within the concept of form, we can distinguish between a thing's substantial form, which makes it what it is, and its accidental form, which simply modifies it. So flowing from a thing's substantial form come its essential properties, the, thing it the things it has by merit of being the thing it is, and then a thing's accidental form is made up of its accidental properties. So to give you a concrete example, our substantial form is that of humanity. It makes us what we are. And examples of our accidental properties would include things like our, our location, the length of our hair, our nationality, and things like that. And so you can undergo a change in your accidental form while still continuing to exist. I could apply for uh, American citizenship and go through that process, and then I'd eventually become an American citizen, I wouldn't all of a sudden cease to exist or cease to be me. There wouldn't be a new Richard that's taken my place. It would just be me who's taken on a new accidental form. Likewise, if I grew my hair longer or cut it short or anything like that. But my substantial form, that, that's locked in. That can't change. If I cease to be human, I cease to be Richard. Um, something else. So if Medusa turned you into a statue, and you're, and you're now a statue, you don't exist anymore, unfortunately. Sometimes it's tricky to phrase that, because I said you'd become a statue. You wouldn't be the statue. You would have ceased to exist. Hopefully the point is clear enough.
And so again, form is is intrinsic to the thing in question. I'll go back. Form is intrinsic to the thing in question. Where's your form? It's right there. Where are your accidents? They're right there, much like your matter, which is right there. So then considering what the extrinsic determinants of things, efficient causes and final causes, efficient causes the from where it came, causing the way we tend to think of it, what actualizes or creates an object and so on. So there may be more than one, but two of your efficient causes are your parents. And if you're uh, sitting on a wooden chair, then that the efficient cause of the chair is, is the carpenter who made it or the factory who made it or something like that. We then have the final cause, the what it does, which is the way or ways of things characteristically behaves. Or perhaps I think, looking back, I think I actually should phrase that a little bit more precisely. Technically, it's the end states to which a thing's characteristic behaviours point. So as an example, uh, one of the ends of an acorn is to grow uh, roots and to grow a, a, a trunk and branches and leaves and in turn to produce acorns of its own. So its ends are to become a fully functioning adult oak tree. Um, so it's not just the growth itself, it's, it's the whole package. An object's final causes are also sometimes called its ends, and there may be more than one. An object's ends are defined by its form. What it is determines what it does. Because it's an acorn, acorn it will grow into an oak tree, or because it's a ball, it will roll downhill. And as I said, efficient and final causes are the application of the theory of act and potency to the extrinsic determinants of things, because the, uh, <clears throat> its efficient causes and the ends to which it points are all external to it. You're not your parents, and <clears throat> uh, uh, rolling downhill is not a ball, and so on and so forth. What are the main differences between substantial form and platonic form? Uh, I, I'll, I'll, excellent question. Uh, I'm pleased to see that that means that person's following along really well. I will come on to that in a, in a little bit. But ultimately, all of Aristotle's four causes follow from his distinction between act and potency. Efficient causes actualize, create or change things. Final causes are a subset of a thing's potencies, those which flow from its form. A thing's form is actualized in matter when an object is created, God and the angels aside. The matter out of which material objects are made has the potency to take on other forms, uh, and so on and so forth. So to answer uh, the, the person's questions, the distinction between Aristotelian uh, forms and Platonic forms is in their location. So for Plato, there's the realm of forms, this heavenly uh, other, I don't know how to describe it, dimension, universe, uh, plane of existence. Uh, the form of humanity exists perfectly. The form of being a dog, of being green, being red, of the good and the true, and so on and so. Forth. So they're they're up there, and then the objects down here in our realm imperfectly partake in those. So all of us partake in the form of humanity. None of us are perfectly human. There's little imperfections in us, but we all partake in that. For Aristotle, there is no Platonic realm of the forms. Your form is right there. My form is right here. You might have the same form, but it's instantiated twice. Here's mine, there's yours. So there is no platonic realm of the forms. So that's the important distinction. Similarly, redness, if you've got a, a red ball, where's the redness? It's right there. The form of redness is right there. It's not partaking in any otherworldly form of redness. So we... And so that then brings on to the idea of universals. Universals exist as shared essences considered in abstract. So for, for Plato, the forms are the universals. There's, there's the form of humanity that all human beings universally share in. For Aristotle, however, a universal only exists in the mind. I look at your humanity, I look at your humanity, look at your humanity, and I abstract away from them and go, oh yeah, they've got something in common, they're all humans. As a universal, it only exists in my mind. Forms themselves just exist as individuals right there. So to summarize, material objects are actually certain ways, but potentially in others. There's something in particular, form. We can consider what things are in abstract, universals. They're made up of matter, material causes, and they are created and changed by other objects, efficient causes. And they, well, they characteristically behave in certain ways which is directed towards certain end states, their ends or their final cause.
Okay, so I appreciate the fact that that might have felt like a bit of a weird aside, but what we're going to see is that Aristotle and then later Aquinas ground uh, their ethics in their metaphysics. So we're going to look at both virtue ethics and natural law theory. The reason I'm going to do that is one, they're very closely related. So if you've got one, you might as well do the other. Uh, and uh, two, they're both very popular within the Christian tradition, particularly in the Catholic and Anglican churches. But there's nothing to stop you from being from another denomination and uh, subscribing to it. Um, and then the, the final question I want you to sort of think about throughout this is, are they mutually exclusive? Because there's a, a number of people who think that really two sides of the coin. Uh, and I, I think that's probably what I think. Uh, and I think there are advantages to that, which, again, we can back around in the discussion a bit if you want. But we're going to look at virtue ethics and natural law. So I'm going to explain how Aristotle and other Aristotelians ground their ethics in a metaphysical schema. It's important to note that not all Aristotelians will do this. So some will jump straight to the virtues or goods more on that in a moment, without any metaphysical analysis, for example, the new natural law theorists. The traditional Aristotelians ground an Aristotelian ethical schema in an Aristotelian metaphysical schema. And so some examples here are the classical natural law theorists, such as David Oderberg. We'll look at his theory in a little bit. And some virtue ethicists. The virtue ethicists who tend to do this are in, invariably Christians. This view can be contrasted with, say, modern uh, Aristotelians who separate Aristotelian ethics from Aristotelian metaphysics. And these include what are called the new natural law theorists, e.g. John Finnis, who, who is, who is a, a, a Catholic, a, a Christian. So you can be a new natural law theorist and a Christian, that's fine. And then other virtue ethicists who don't ground it in the metaphysics, they tend to be more Non, non Christians, non non believers. Although again, there are always exceptions. Traditional Aristotelians begin with a metaphysical analysis of human nature, whereas modern Aristotelians jump straight into the basic goods or the virtues. So recall Aristotle's metaphysics. He thinks that we all have a substantial form, and he thought that the form of humanity was rational animality. We're animals because we've got bodies, and we engage in you know, three Fs, feeding, fighting, fornicating, right? <laughs> we're animals and we need to be upfront about that. But we're distinctive in that we're rational and that transforms our animality in important and interesting ways. And for him, those were the most important elements of what makes us, us. Um, we could appeal to our, our bodily structure and so on and so forth and the uh, uh, the fact that we've got uh, ten, 10 fingers and four limbs and 10 toes, we could, we could have built all of that. But those somehow seem less important than our rationality and our animality. And that also explains why when we, we think about intelligent aliens, like, like in the film E.T., one of the reasons we empathize with him and we feel a sort of kinship with him is because he's also a rational animal. But he, I don't think he had 10, 10 fingers, I think he had six. Like I haven't seen the film in ages. Hopefully you get the idea. The important bit is that we're rational and we're animals. Our form, that of rational animals, gives us certain ends, certain ways we ought to be and behave. Unlike inanimate objects and plants, and then animals, so deliberate question mark there, we can then choose whether or not to fulfill these ends. So there's a moral dimension to our ends in a way that there isn't for inanimate objects and plants in anything but a very trivial sense. Plants and inanimate objects will always fulfill their ends if the circumstances permit and there's nothing stopping them, thus they always behave as they should. So it's, it's in the Northern Hemisphere, it's springtime here, I've been planting some tomatoes. Uh, few have survived and it's enough for, for my purposes, so I'm pleased, but uh, quite a few of them died and I haven't quite worked out why. I think it's because they didn't get quite enough sunlight. I didn't blame the tomato plants for being immoral. I thought there's something stopping them from flourishing. And that was, I think, because they didn't get quite enough sunlight. But when a human being doesn't fulfill their ends, potentially we, we morally blame them. It, it might depend on the circumstances. If they're, they're mentally unwell or they're sick or anything like that, then obviously that, that explains it. But if they're well 
and they do something that they shouldn't, and there's potentially at least moral blame. So we can choose whether or not to fill our ends, we can choose whether or not we will behave as we should. You can see how we get from the metaphysics to the ethics. So both classical natural law theorists and some virtue ethicists will agree on this so far, but now they begin to come apart. Natural law theorists will now derive a list of human goods and or human rights that flow from our ends. Thus, their interest in what we ought to do and have, pursue, promote, and so on, considered externally. This is because the human goods are external to the humans. Uh, to humans. You may remember, uh, uh, I said earlier, the, the ends are extrinsic to the object in question. They're not the humans, they're not the humans themselves, nor an aspect of humanity. Instead, there are things you have, promote, pursue, defend, and so on. So what are the, the goods? Here's a sort of sample list uh, that different thinkers have given. And again, we can dig into this in more detail. And there's a lot of detail here, obviously. Uh, I'm sort of slightly skipping over some steps for the, for the sake of time and clarity, but I hope that you can see why they've picked these sorts of things. So John Finnis, life, knowledge, play, aesthetic experience, friendship, religion, practical reasonableness. Alfonso uh, Finnis, you may remember as a new natural law theorist. Alfonso Gomez Lobo, life, the family, friendship, work and play, the experience of beauty, knowledge, integrity. Uh, Chapel tends to just have a bit of everything. Life, truth, and the knowledge of truth, friendship, aesthetic value, physical and mental health and harmony, pleasure in the avoidance of pain, reason, rationality, and reasonableness, the natural world, people's fairness, achievements, the contemplation of God, if God exists. Mark Murphy, life, knowledge, aesthetic experience, excellence in play and work, excellence in agency, inner peace, friendship and community, religion, happiness. David Oderberg, life, knowledge, friendship, work and play, the appreciation of beauty, religious belief and practice. So uh, David is, is a classic natural law theory. And then if you're interested in, in my own uh, views, uh, life and health, both mental and physical, family, friendship uh, and community, aesthetic experience, uh, potentially rationality, knowledge uh, and religion, broadly conceived. What we would, what we would say is that these things are uh, correspond to our ends. These are the things to which human beings are directed. A fully uh, flourishing, happy, complete human being has all of these things. Uh, prioritize some over others, and the, maybe some they, they, they can't pursue at all, and then they pursue others in, in turn. But these are the sorts of things that they're interested in. So though we've now arrived at a list of goods, a list of values, we still need some more concrete guidance on what we actually ought to do and not do in the real world. The natural law theorists now take one of two options. The first is to derive a list of rights from the basic goods, and from this a list of duties. The second is to derive a list of duties from the basic goods, and from this potential list of rights. So some natural law theorists will argue that relating to each good, there's a relevant right. For example, if life is a basic human good, then we must have a right to life and the right not to be killed. If knowledge is a basic human good, then we must have the right uh, not to be deceived, at least not uh, all other things being equal. Y you might want to add some caveats to that. Um, of course. That remains to be seen. And from the right to life, presumably it follows that we have a duty not to kill. After all, if they have the right not to be killed, then presumably we have a duty not to kill them. And perhaps then duties and rights are simply two sides of the same coin. As a term of art, a duty not to do something is sometimes called a negative duty, and a duty to do something is sometimes called a positive duty. Likewise, sometimes philosophers distinguish between positive rights, which are sort of rights to something, and education, and negative rights, which is the right sort of not to be interfered with when it comes to that thing. Uh, if you're interested, I don't take this approach, I take the other approach. And the reason is, I, it seems to me that uh, negative rights and negative duties follow very naturally from this analysis. And although I can see how you might go about getting positive rights and positive duties, uh, I worry that the, the uh, strength of those rights and duties might not be quite so obvious. So I tend to uh, uh, take this opposite approach. And we go from goods to duties. So a natural law theorist might argue that we ought to promote the basic human goods. We obviously ought to promote them in our own lives, since it makes us better off, but we also ought to promote them in the lives of others. You know, we're sociable and communal creatures, so Aristotle also calls us political animals. 
and by our very nature. And this entails that we ought to help each other and cooperate with each other. My good and your good, they're interlinked. So we have a series of duties to promote and protect the basic goods, both in our own lives and in the lives of others. So knowledge is a basic good. So we have a duty not to lie, at least all other things being equal, and a duty to tell the truth. Life is a basic good, so we have a duty uh, to save people when we're able to do so. Things like that. And then we can derive a list of rights from a list of duties by switching our perspective. If I have a duty not to kill you, then presumably you have the right not to be killed by me. And again, in this sense, duties and rights are two sides of the same coin. So just, uh, and so again, another thing to point out, the two strategies that natural law ethicists state, they're not mutually exclusive. Yeah, so uh, I know I know David personally, David Oderberg, he takes the approach where he goes from the goods to rights to duties. I take the approach where I go from goods to duties to rights. And when we've discussed it, there hasn't been any major disagreement on the, on that point. It's just a preference for which which way is more fruitful. And I've explained why I prefer this way. But here's a summary of natural law. If you're a classical natural law theorist, you start with essence or nature, rational animality. From that, you derive a list of human ends. From that, you derive a list of basic human goods. The new natural law theorists jump straight in at the basic human goods. They don't engage in the previous steps. And from that, we all derive a list of duties and rights. So that's natural law uh, ethics. So virtue ethicists, rather than deriving a list of goods that flow from our form and end, they instead derive a list of virtues that flow from our ends. They're interested in what we ought to do and, more importantly, be considered internally. And why this is becomes clear when we examine the definition of a virtue. So Rosalind Hursthouse, not, not a religious thinker, um, but you know, just she, she offers a, a good definition. A virtue is a character trait. A human being needs to flourish or live well. And so a virtue is something internal to us since it's a character trait which we should possess. And the opposite of a virtue is a vice. Uh, again, as a term of art, so when a virtue ethicist calls someone someone vicious, they don't necessarily mean that person is cruel. So in contemporary English, vicious is kind of a synonym with cruel. Cruelty would be a vice. But it wouldn't be the only vice. So someone who's lazy would also be vicious because they've got this vice. That's, that's the broader sense of the term vicious. And then someone who has the virtues is virtuous, virtuous and vicious. That's where the word comes from. For some reason, vicious now is equated with cruelty, which is only one vice. So a person who fulfills all their ends will have a wide variety of virtues, of which, according to Aristotle, the intellectual virtues are the best. And the reason he thinks that is because we're rational animals. The other uh, virtues, at least to some extent, are more based in our animality. You don't need to follow him in that. A virtuous person who behaves as they should will live a good life, and Aristotle calls this eudaimonia which is sometimes translated as flourishing. Uh, sometimes it's also translated as happiness. I don't particularly like that uh, translation because it, it doesn't have quite the right connotations. We think of happiness as being a sort of subjective psychological state. Eudaimonia is much broader than that. You know, it's a person being and doing everything that they should do and be. And so one would hope that that person enjoys a degree of psychological contentment and joy and so on and so forth. But it's much more than just that. So the goal of human existence, according to Aristotle, is to achieve eudaimonia. Uh, Aquinas kind of takes this idea and he, he suggests that the goal of human existence is to achieve beatitudio, which is kind of eudaimonia plus an experience or the vision of God. So for Aristotle, uh, for, for Aquinas to be uh, fully complete as a human being, ultimately we need God. We can only get so far by ourselves. According to Aristotle, we can do it all ourselves. So each of the virtues is between two extremes, not too much, not too little. And this idea is called the golden mean. So as an example, bravery lies between cowardice and foolhardiness or rashness. I won't read them all out because there's a lot of them. Uh, this is the list that Aristotle gives in his Nicomachean Ethics. 
I'll, I'll pause the functions if you want to read it. You can pause the video. As you can see, excess deficiency and then the mean, and you'll note that it applies to all areas of life. So again, a summary of virtue ethic, ethics. If you're being sort of really traditional about it, you start with your essence or nature, human ends, and then virtues. If you're a more contemporary virtue ethicist, they tend to just jump in at the virtues. And then uh, eventually from that, you derive a list of duties and rights. The reason I put a question mark there is for two reasons. One, uh, I haven't explored that in this lecture because it I'm mindful of, of limits. Uh, the other is that uh, standard criticism of virtue ethics is that it struggles to give us really clear uh, advice on how to behave and what to do and so on and so forth. And thus, it struggles to drive a clear list of duties and rights. So that's one of the standard criticisms of it. So I put that in a question mark for you to think about. So bringing it all together, we looked at a couple of different things. We looked at Aristotle. We looked at his metaphysics. We briefly looked at some of the uh, additions that Aquinas made, and then we looked at his ethics, and then natural law theory and virtue ethics. Now, normally, Aquinas is considered the sort of father of natural law theory, and Aristotle is considered the father of virtue ethics. But the reality is that uh, Aquinas himself spent more time discussing the virtues than he did discussing natural law. Uh, so you could see him as either a virtue ethicist or a natural law theorist. Aristotle does dedicate most of his time to the virtues, uh, but you know, as you've seen, natural law theorists really do ground it in you know, the Aristotelian metaphysical schema. So my own take is I wouldn't view them as mutually exclusive. Uh, sometimes I um and are about that, and sometimes I'm, I'm not so certain, but I think they're probably just two sides of the same coin. One considered externally, the basic human goods, one considered internally, the virtues, and potentially the nice thing about that is they correct uh, each other's weaknesses whilst enjoying each other's strength. Some readings, if you're interested, uh, some suggestions. Some of them are more technical than, than others. Uh, at the bottom there, Rusche for Landau's The Fundamental of Ethics. That's that's a really standard introduction to ethics, a book that lots of undergraduates read. So that's a, a good one to start with if you're a complete uh, beginner. He looked at all sorts of different ethics theories in, in lots of detail and ultimately he, he comes down against natural law theory and virtue ethics. It will at least give you an introduction to it. Um, you can read the original Aristotle, the Nicomachean Ethics. Uh, Ed Fesser's Aquinas, a beginner's guide, is really good for um, uh, understanding the metaphysics of Aquinas, not so much detail on the ethics. Uh, for more detail on the ethics, David Oderberg's you know, Moral Theory, a non-consequentialist approach. John Finnis's natural law and natural rights, although that's a hefty, hefty tome, so be aware of that. Anyway, those are some suggestions. Uh, you know, 